Welcome back. We're live here from Supercomputing 22 in Dallas. Paul Gillen for SiliconANGLE and theCUBE with my guest host, Dave. Uh, excuse me. Uh, our our uh, guest today uh, on this segment is Kim Leonar, who is a storage performance architect at uh, Broadcom. And uh, the topic of this conversation is, is, uh, is networking, it's connectivity. I guess, how does that relate to the work of a storage performance architect? Uh, well, that's a really good question. So yeah, I, I have been focused on storage performance for about 22 years, but even, even if we're talking about just storage, the all the components have a really big impact on ultimately how quickly you can access your data. So, you know, the, the switches, um, the memory bandwidth, the, uh, the expanders, the uh, just the different protocols that you're using, and so, and the big part of it is actually Ethernet because, as you know, data is not siloed anymore. You have to be able to access it from anywhere in the world. So wait, so you're telling me that we're just not living in a CPU-centric <laughs> world now? Uh, because it is it is sort of interesting when we talk about supercomputing and high-performance computing, we're always talking about clustering systems. So how do you? connect those systems, isn't, uh, that, isn't that kind of your, uh, it, your wheelhouse? It really is, it's, it is, it is Broadcom's wheelhouse. We are all about interconnectivity, and we own the interconnectivity. You know, you know years ago it was, hey, you know, buy this new server because you know, we, we've added more cores or we've got better memory, but now you've got all this siloed data and we've got, you know, we've got this, this software defined kind of environment now, this composable environments where, hey, if you need more networking, just plug this in, or just go in here and just allocate yourself more. So what we're seeing is these silos really of, hey, here's our compute, here's your networking, here's your storage, uh, and so how do you put those all together? The thing is interconnectivity, so. Um, it, that's really what we specialize in. I'm really, uh, you know, I'm really happy to be here to talk about some of the things that that we do to enable um, high performance computing. Well, now we're seeing, uh, you know, new breed of AI computers being built with uh, multiple GPUs, very large amounts of data being transferred between them, and the internet really has become a, bo a bottleneck. The interconnect has become a, bottle a bottleneck. Is that something that Broadcom is working on alleviating? Absolutely, so we work with a lot of different, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different standards that we work with to define so that we can make sure that we work everywhere. So even if you're just a dentist's office that's deploying one server, or we're talking about these hyperscalers that are, you know, that have thousands or, you know, tens of thousands of servers, um, you know, we're working on making sure that the next generation is able to outperform the previous generation. Not only that, but we found that, you know, with these siloed things, if, if you add more storage, but that means we're going to eat up six cores using that, it's not really as useful. So Broadcom's really been focused on trying to offload the CPU. So we're offloading it from you know, data security, data protection, you know, we do packet sniffing ourselves and things like that. So no longer do we rely on the CPU to do that kind of processing for us, but we become very smart devices all on our own so that they work very well in these kind of environments. So how about, uh, g give us an example, I know, um, a lot of the discussion here has been around using Ethernet mm -hmm. as the connectivity layer. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in, in the past, people would think about supercomputing as exclusively being uh, InfiniBand based. <laughs> but give, give us an idea of what Broadcom is doing in the Ethernet space. What, you know, what's, what are the advantages of using Ethernet? So we've made two really big announcements. The first one is our Tomahawk 5 Ethernet switch. So it's a 400 gigi Ethernet switch. And the other thing we announced too was our Thor. So we have, uh, these are our network controllers that also support up to 400 gigi each as well. So those two alone, it just it's amazing to me how much data we're able to transfer with those. But not only that, but they're super, super intelligent controllers too. Um, and then we realized, um, you know, hey, we're, ma we're managing all this data, let's go ahead and offload the CPU. So we actually adopted the Rocky standard. So that's one of the things that puts us above InfiniBand is that Ethernet is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And InfiniBand is primarily just owned by one or two companies. Uh, and, and so, and it's also a lot more expensive. So Ethernet is just, it's everywhere. And now with the, with the Rocky standards um, that we're working along with, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it does what you're talking about, much better than, you know, 
predecessors. Well, tell us about the Rocky Standards. I'm not familiar with it. I'm sure some of our <laughs> listeners are not. What is the Rocky Standard? <laughs> so it's our DMA over converged Ethernet. I'm not a Rocky expert myself, but I am an expert on how to offload the CPU. And so one of the things it does is instead of using the CPU to transfer the data from the, you know, the user space, um, over to the next you know, server when you're tra transferring it, we actually will do it ourselves, so we'll handle it ourselves. We will take it, we will move it across the wire and we will put it in that remote computer and we don't have to ask the CPU to do anything uh, to get involved in that. So, big, you know, it's a big savings. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, because there are parts of the InfiniBand protocol that are essentially embedded in RDMA over converged Ethernet. So, right. so if, you can, if you can leverage kind of the best of both worlds, but have it in an ethernet environment which is already ubiquitous, um, it seems like it's kind of democratizing supercomputing and, and, and HPC. And I know you guys are um, big partners with Dell as an example. You guys work with all sorts of other people. Yeah. Um, but let's say, let's say somebody's going to be doing uh, ethernet for connectivity. You also offer switches? We do, actually. So is that, I mean, that's another piece of the puzzle? That's a big piece of the puzzle. So we just released our, our Atlas II switch. It is a PCIe Gen 5 switch. Uh, and um, What does that mean? What is Gen, Gen 5? What does that oh, mean? Oh, Gen 5 PCIe. Uh, it's, it's the magic connectivity right now. So, you know, we talk about the Sapphire Rapids release um, as well as the Genoa release. I know that those, you know, those have been talked about a lot here. I've been walking around and everybody's talking about it. Well, those enable the Gen 5 PCIe interfaces. So we've been able to double the band with from the Gen 4 up to the Gen 5. So in order to support that, we do now have our Atlas 2 PCIe Gen 5 switch, and it allows you to connect, especially around here, we're talking about you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. A lot of these are relying on the GPUs and the DPUs that you see you know, a, lot, a lot of people talking about enabling. So by in, you know, putting these switches in the servers, you can connect multitudes of not only NVMe devices, but also these GPUs and these, these CPUs. So, um, besides that, we also have the storage component of it too. So to support that, we, we just recently have released our 9500 series HBAs which support 24 gig SAS. And you know, this is kind of a this is kind of a big deal for some of our hyperscalers that say, hey look, our next generation, we're putting a hundred hard drives in. So we're like, you know, so a lot of it is maybe for cold storage, but by giving them that 24 gig bandwidth and by having these mass 24 gig SAS expanders that allows these hyperscalers to build up their systems. How are you supporting the HPC community writ large? I and mean, what are you doing that's exclusively for uh, supercomputing? Exclusively for, <laughs> so we're doing the inter interconnectivity really for them. Uh, you know, you can have as, as, as much compute power as you want, but these are very data hungry applications. And a lot of that data is not sitting right in the box. A lot of that data is sitting in some other country or in some other city or just the box next door. So to be able to move that data around, you know, there's a new concept where they say, um, you know, do the compute where the data is, and then there's another kind of, you know, the, the other way is move the data around, which is a lot easier kind of sometimes, but, um, so we're allowing us to move that data around. So for that, you know, we do have our, our Tomahawk switches, we've got our Thor NICs, and of course we got you know, the really wide pipe. So our, our new 9500 series HBA and RAID controllers not only allow us to do, so we're doing 28 gigabytes a second that we can transfer through the one controller and that's on protected data. So we can actually have the high availability protected data of RAID 5 or RAID 6 or RAID 10 um, in the box giving in 27 gigabytes a second. So it's, it's unheard of. The latency that we're seeing even off of this too, we have a write cache latency that is sub eight microseconds. That is lower than most of the NVMe drives that you see, you know, that are available today. So, so you know, we're able to support these applications that require really low latency as well as data protection. So, so often when we talk about the, the underlying hardware, it's a, it's a game of you know, whack-a-mole, chase the bottleneck. Uh -huh. And so you've mentioned uh, PCIe 5. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks who will be implementing 5, Gen 5, PCIe 5, are coming off of 3, not even 4. I know. Right? So, they're making, so, so they're not just getting a last generation to this generation bump, but they're getting a two generations They bump. are. How does that, do, do, um, is it the case that it would never make sense to use a 
next gen or current gen card in an older generation bus because of the mismatch in performance. Are these things all designed to work together? Uh, that's a really tough question. Um, I want to say no, it doesn't make sense. Um, it, it really makes sense just to kind of move things forward um, and buy a card that's made for the bus it's in. However, um, that's not always the case. So for instance, our 9500 controller is a Gen 4 PCIe. But what we did, uh, and we doubled the PCIe, so it's a by 16, even though it's a Gen 4, it's a by 16, so we're getting really, really good bandwidth out of it. As I said before, you know, we're getting 28, 27.8 or almost 28 gigabytes a second bandwidth out of that by doubling the PCIe But they bus. work together, it all works together. All yeah, works yeah, okay. together. You can, put a, you can put our Gen 4 and a Gen 5 all day long and they work beautifully. Yeah, we, we do work to validate that. We're almost out of time, but I, I want to ask you a more uh, nuts and bolts question about storage. And we've uh. heard for you know for years that the aerial density of hard disks has been reached, and there's really no no way to accelerate. There's no way to make the, the disk any denser. What does the future of the hard disk look like as a storage medium? Multi actuator, actually, we're seeing a lot of multi actuator. Uh, I was surprised to see it come across my desk, uh, you know, because our 9500 actually does support multi actuator, uh, and, um, and and so it was really neat. After I've been working with hard drives for 22 years, and I remember when they could do. Um, 30 megabytes a second, and that was amazing. That was like, wow, 30 megabytes a second. Um, and then, about 15 years ago, they hit around 200 to 250 megabytes a second, and they stayed there. They haven't gone anywhere. Um, what they have done is they've increased the density so that you can have more storage. So you can easily go out and buy 15 to 30 terabyte drive, but you're not going to get any more performance. So what they've done is they've added multiple actuators. So each one of these can do its own streaming, and each one of these can actually do their own seeking. So you can get two and four, and I've even seen a talk about you know eight actuator per disk. I, I don't think that, that I think that's still theory, but um, but they could implement those. So that's one of the things that we're seeing. Uh. O old technology somehow finds a way to, to remain current, even, uh, uh, even in the face of, of new alternatives. Kim Leon, our uh, storage architect, storage performance architect at Broadcom, thanks so much for being here with oh, us thank today. Thank you so much for having me. This is Paul Gillen with Dave Nicholson here at Supercomputing 22. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.